Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Eunice Mathis. I'm a registered nurse and also the owner of Florida Training Academy. In today's video, we're going to be reviewing 60 multiple choice practice questions to help you pass the certified nursing assistant examination. We call it for short, the CNA exam. In Jacksonville, Florida, we offer CNA exam prep courses and also CNA train the trainer courses for nurses. So whether you're a student who's looking to get a um, entry into the medical field, or if you're a nurse who's looking to do something else with their career, and also start training others, um, we're definitely here to assist you. If you look at our playlist, you're going to see videos on CPR, CNA skills, and also CNA practice questions. If you follow us, go ahead and subscribe to our channel. Within the next two to three days, we should have new clinical videos, um, skills videos being posted. And so that way you can always be learning and practicing as you prepare to take your CNA exam. Our website is fltraining.com. That's fltraining.com. And let's start with question number one. Question number one, which of the following should you observe and record when admitting a patient? A, the color of the stool and the amount of urine voided. B, how much the patient has eaten or drunk. C, bruises, marks, rashes, or broken skin. D, request the patient makes. All right, so if this is your first encounter with this person, unless there's something grossly abnormal with the stool or the urine, that's not something I report to the nurse right away. But as a healthcare provider, we are mandatory reporters. And so if you see bruises or marks, that could be a sign of, um, of abuse. You want to make sure that you actually report that to the nurse. And so I think that for number one, the correct answer is going to be C. And let's see what this system says. All right, it says the correct answer is C, failure to notice bruises or marks on the skin on admission may later cause someone to believe that you were of, um, involved in abuse, right? Question number two, when responding to a patient on the, when responding to a patient on the intercom, you should um, A, ask the patient's name, B, say, may I help you? D, give your name and position. D, say the nurse will answer your call. All right, so a patient's calling you, you have the intercom, I'm going to say that you're going to ask, may I help you? I'm not sure though, so don't judge me too harshly. Let's see. I was incorrect. When responding to a patient on the intercom, you should give your name and position. Well, I guess a lot of us do that incorrectly. So, so far, everybody, I've missed one question. Three, which of the following things should you do to familiarize a new patient to his or her surroundings? A, show the patient where the call bell is and how to work it. B, tell the patient not to operate the TV. C, ask visitors to leave the room while you finish admitting the patient. D, raise the side rails of the bed and raise the bed to a high position. Well, we're not going to be raising the bed to a high position just to be showing someone their surroundings um, because that would be unsafe. I think the best answer for this question is going to be A, because I'm considering the patient's safety. And if I'm familiarizing them with their room and their surroundings, I definitely want them to know how to operate the call bell. Let's see if I'm correct. And the correct answer is A, you should never leave a new admit until the patient knows how to call for help. Question number four, when arranging a patient's room, you should do all of the following except check signal cords, fix the back and knee rest as directed, administer medications, check lighting. So this requires you to know the role of the CNA and CNAs do not administer medications. Nurses, respiratory therapists, pharmacists and doctors administer medication. And so I think that the exception to the rule um, would be C. You can do everything except for administer medications. And that is correct. Nursing assistants are never allowed to give medications. There are some medication aid or medication tech courses that you can take once you're certified as a CNA. However, I need you to remember that when you're taking the exam, you're not at that level yet. You've not taken these additional courses and you cannot assist with medications. If you touch a pill, you're stepping outside of your scope of practice. Question number five, when assisting a patient in and out of bed, you should always employ body mechanic techniques. B, get another person to help. C, put the patient's feet out first and then lift the back up. D, put shoes on the patient because the patient may slip. When you're assisting someone out of bed, you should always I'm going to say D. Yes, we want you to use good body mechanics, but we also need to make sure that the patient doesn't fall. Oh, this is a tricky one. 
if I get it wrong, don't judge me too harshly. I got it wrong. I don't like this test, you all, but we're going to continue on. <laughs> it says you should always use good body mechanics when moving patients. Yeah, I'm going to think about that one. Six, when you wash your hands, A. Six, when should you wash your hands? A, when you notice that they look or feel dirty. B, when the head nurse tells you to. C, at least twice a day. D, before and after patient contact. And the correct answer for this is going to be D as in dog, before and after patient contact. Question number seven. Which of the following is the correct procedure for serving a meal to a patient who must be fed? A, serve the tray along with all the other trays and then come back to feed the patient. B, bring the tray to the patient last. Feed after you have served all the other patients. C, bring the tray into the room when you are ready to feed the patient. And then D, have the kitchen hold the tray for one hour. Um, I don't want to increase my patient's hunger or their anticipation to eat. So I'm probably not going to bring that tray into the room until I am ready to feed him or her. So I think the answer is C, but I've been wrong twice so far. So let's see what the answer is. All right, and so this one also confirms um, you should not bring the tray into the room until you have time to feed the patient. Eight, a newly admitted patient has dirty fingernails. When given the patient a bath, you should first soak the nails, trim the nails, apply extra lotion, clean the nails with a metal file. Well, I can tell you now we're not using metal on our patients. That would be a safety hazard. So I'm going to say that we're going to soak the nails so that we can loosen up some of the residue that's beneath their nails. I think the answer is A. All right. And so the correct answer is A. It says that soaking the nails first will make them easier to clean. Question number nine, when you move a patient on a stretcher, you should stand at the patient's right side, left side, head, or feet. And I want to think, I want you to think about it. If you've ever seen a stretcher before, where are the handles on the stretcher? It's always at the head. So I'm going to say that the answer to number nine is C. And that is correct. Always control a stretcher from the head in case you lose control of it. Ten. The most serious problem that wrinkles in the bed clothes can cause is restlessness, sleeplessness, decubitus ulcers, or bleeding and shock. Whenever you leave that extra material beneath your patient, whether it's their gown or pads, um, that wrinkle can cause an indentation. Think about when you have socks on for too long and you get those little creases. Same thing can happen to your patient's skin. And because their skin is frail, one of those creases can actually open and we have the start of a sore. So I'm going to say the answer is going to be C as in cat. All right. And great. Um, this particular response states that the most serious problems that wrinkles in the bed clothes can cause are the cubitus ulcers or the cubit eye. Question 11. When making a bed, you can save steps and time if you A, assemble all needed linen before, st before starting to make the bed. B, tuck in the bottom linen and top linen at the foot of the bed before going to the head of the bed. C, only use fitted sheets. D, ask for help from the head nurse. I'm sure she's busy with other duties. And so in order to save your step, um, in order to save some time and some steps, we need you to collect all your equipment first, have everything you need. And I think the answer to number 11 is A, and that is correct. You want to gather all supplies first in order to save time. 12, one important way to reduce the risk of decubitus ulcers, and that's like pressure injuries from a person laying in place too long, is to A, keep the patient in bed, and B, force fluids every two hours, mm -mm. D, change positions every two hours, D, all of the above. And so even if you have a patient who is bedridden, we don't keep them in bed all day. We use like a Hoyer lift or a crane in order to reposition them and maybe get them up into a geriatric chair. So I think the answer for number 12 is C is in cat. And yay, I'm winning again. Whew, it was hard. I missed two so far. Changing a patient's position every two hours prevent, prevents bed sores. 13, you are told to put a patient in Fowler's position. Before changing the position of the patient's bed, you should A, open the window, B, explain the procedure to the patient, C, check 
with the patient's family. D, remake the bed. And so when you think of a phallus position, flat is supine. When someone is laying on their spine, they're in a supine position. When you think of phallus position, think of a reclining position that would be semi phallus or high phallus of a patient in short of breath or they're vomiting. You don't want them vomiting when they're laying back. You're going to put them in a high phallus position. Before I change someone's position, I want to explain the procedure to them and let them know the reason why I am doing so. So I think the answer to number 13 is B as in boy. And the response states, you should always explain procedures first. Um, so that makes B the correct answer. 14, you touch the inside of the sink while rinsing soap off your hands. You should A, allow the water to run over your hands for two minutes. B, dry your hands and turn off the faucet with the paper towel. C, repeat the wash from the beginning. D, none of the above. If you contaminated your hands, we need you to go back and cleanse your hands. So I think the answer is C. Right. And the response states you have contaminated your hands and must start over again. Question 15. As a safety measure, when you give mouth care to an unconscious patient, you should position a patient A on his or her back, B in a semi phallus position, C with the head turned to the side, and D in a supine position. Remember, for the supine position, if you take the U out, they're laying on their spine, which means they're laying flat, and that's guaranteed to cause your patient to aspirate. So we know D is not the correct answer. If someone is unconscious, more than likely they do not have a gag reflex. So even putting the smallest amount of liquid in their mouth could actually cause that liquid to travel back into their airway and they can aspirate. So the answer is also not B. The correct response is going to be C. Whenever you turn that patient to his or her side or turn their head to the side, it's going to allow the um, secretions to accumulate in the jaw, jaw area. And if you have a yonker or a suction wand, you can go in there and remove those excess secretions safely. So the answer to number 15 should be C as in cat. All right, and awesome. Turn the head to the side will assist with the drainage out of the mouth. 16, when you obtain a clean catch urine specimen, you should wash the patient's hands or B, use clean techniques. C, use sterile techniques. D, perform the procedure in the bathroom. It doesn't matter. You're just catching urine. So you can catch urine in a bedpan. So they don't have to be in the bathroom. So it would not be D. A clean catch specimen is not a sterile specimen. And so since you're the one performing the skill, you're going to have gloves on and you would have washed your hands. You would not have to wash the residents or the patient's hands before you start a clean catch specimen. So the answer for this one is going to be B as in boy. A clean catch urine specimen does not require sterile technique. Question 17, Mr. Rourke, a newly admitted conscious patient has been put to bed. Before leaving him alone, you should A, ask if he is hungry, B, inspect his skin, C, complete the listing of his clothing and valuables, D, make sure he knows how to use the call light. Um, of course, C is correct. Of course, B is correct. <laughs> but you're about to put him to bed. And if he is newly admitted, we're going to think of safety first. I'm going to say the answer is D. Make sure he knows how to use his call light. OK. And we also got that one correct. We're doing good, team. Great job. 18, when lifting a heavy object, you should bend at the waist, keeping your legs straight. B, at the waist, rounding your shoulders. C, at the knees, keeping your back straight. D, you should bend at the knees and the waist. Oh my, that's a lot. I think the answer is going to be C. You want to keep that back straight and use your leg muscles. So um, we're going to see if C is right. When lifting a he heavy object, keep your back straight. Keeping your back straight forces you to use your strong leg muscles. Great job. 19, we already covered this one. Wrinkles in the bed clothes can A, overheat the patient. B, irritate the patient's skin. C, result in torn sheets. D, restrict the patient's activity. What do those wrinkles do? Um, I don't like the word irritate here, but that's the word they chose. So I'm going to say the answer is B. All right. And the irritation can lead to bed sores. 20, when shaving a resident, you should wet the patient's face. Apply aftershave lotion when done. C, give the patient a mirror when done. D, all of the above. I think the answer is all of the above. And that is correct too. 21, when cleaning a patient's dentures at the sink, the reason to either line the emesis basin with a paper towel or fill the sink with water is to 
A, prevent contamination of the dentures. B, hide the dentures from view. C, guard against breaking the dentures. D, protect the basin from scratches. The dentures are more expensive than the basin. So I know that D isn't the correct answer. And whenever you think about those dentures, when they're coming out of someone's mouth, they have saliva, it could have food particles. And even though we have gloves on, it's not a sight that you really want to see. And sometimes because we don't hold the dentures tight enough, the dentures can actually drop, hit the bottom of the sink, and they can actually be damaged. And so in order to prevent that damage, you want to have something in the bottom of your sink and or have something in the bottom of the sink and fill it with a little bit of water. That way, if they drop, it hits the water, the water splashes instead of the denture breaking. And so I'm going to say the answer is C as in cat. Woohoo! The purpose of this procedure is to prevent breakage. Yes. 22. When assisting a resident with eating, one of the first things you should do is cut the food into large bite-sized pieces. That is an oxymoron. Moron. <laughs> large bite size. So it's not A. B. Wash your hands and the patient's hands. C. Butter the patient's bread. D, provide the patient with privacy. If you think about some of the assisted living facilities, they actually eat in a group or a community setting. So you really can't provide privacy. Do, when you're taking a CNA exam, do not think that you're just in one location, such as a hospital where everybody has individual rooms. You're taking care of an adult population, whether that's a group home, assisted living facility, nursing home, or hospital, and also home care. And so I think the best response for this one is you don't want to contaminate the food. So you're going to watch Wash your hands and also you're going to wash the residents or the patient's hands. The answer should be B as in boy. And that is correct. We're going to remember infection control. 23, a patient has a new cast on his right arm. While caring for him, you should observe for a pulse over the cast, color and hardness of the cast, the warmth and color of the fingers, Signed of crumbling at the cast end. All right, so this one is asking you, how do you determine if the person has sufficient circulation once they have a new cast placed? Sometimes the, the um, actual arm, or especially due to the injury, that, that extremity could swell. And if it swells too much, plus it has a tight cast on, we can actually cut off circulation. So going above the cast isn't as important as looking below the cast. And you're gonna be checking the capillary refill and checking to see if that hand is swollen. So so I'm going to say the correct answer is C as in cat, C as in cat. And yes, a new cast may cut off circulation. So C reminds you to check for circulatory impairment. And you're like, well, that's the nurse's role. No, you also are in the room. And if you see the hand is pale, that's something that you can notify the nurse of also. We work as a team and um, some of these nursing homes right now, especially because we're short staffed, there may be one CNA to 15 patients. And so hopefully if there is a floor that has or a hospital that has 30 residents, hopefully you have one or two nurses, but your nurses are busy. They may miss something. At the end of the day, we all work together in order to keep our patients safe. So yes, if you notify, if you notice it, please notify your nurse. 24, encouraging a patient to take part in activities of daily living. We call that ADLs, such as bathing, combing hair, and feeding is A, done only when time permits, B, the family's responsibility, C, necessary for rehabilitation, D, a violation of patient's rights. What I want you to think of is from the time of admission, our goal is to prepare that patient for discharge. We try to keep them as independent as possible for as long as possible. And so you want them moving, combing their hair, even if they have an affected side from a stroke, the side that they can move, you have them participate in their care because it is necessary for rehabilitation. And let's see if we are correct here with the response being C. And yes, we are. Rehabilitation should always be a part of the care plan. So allow your patients to assist, even if it will take you longer to complete a skill. 25, in caring for a confused elderly man, you should remember to keep the bed rails up except for when you are at the bedside. B, close the door to the room so he does not disturb other patients. C, keep the room dark and quiet at all times to keep the patient from becoming upset. D, remind him each morning to shower and shave independently. Uh, recipe for disaster. We're not going to let a confused person shave independently. We're not going to 
keep a confused person in a dark room. That is definitely neglect. Okay. Um, I'm not going to close him off so he does not disturb other residents. Um, this one says keep the bed rails up except for when you are at the bedside. I'm going to choose A because that's the only option, but knowing that in some of your facilities, they are restraint free, which means they could be bed rail free, not hospitals. We're talking about assist living facilities and Alzheimer's units. They have beds that go all the way down to the floor. So for this answer, this is the best response, A, but in the real world, based on where you work, um, you may not be putting all those rails up because there may not be rails on the bed. And research shows that bed rails do not prevent falls. If a person is confused and they want to fall, they simply climb over the rail and then they have a fall from a higher elevation and cause more injury. If you don't believe me, research it yourself. So I'm going to say the 25 is A is an apple. And they even put it there. Make sure to follow the agency policy because it just depends on where you work. Oh, my God. I do not know this answer. The water temperature for a tub bath is 98 degrees Fahrenheit or B, 105 degrees Fahrenheit, C, 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, I definitely know it's not D, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, my. I'm going to go at the safest option. What do you think? It's either A or B. We usually don't go by thermometers whenever we're giving a person a bath and we rarely ever give our patients tub baths. So I'm definitely at a loss with this one. I'm going to think it is A. We usually let the person put their finger in the water, their toe in the water. And if the water is good, then you can allow them to proceed. Oh my, are you smarter than a nurse? Let's see what answer you have. I say A. I was wrong, you all. That means I missed three so far. The water temperature for a tub bath is 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Fortunately, unless you're like in home care, you're not going to be giving your patient tub baths. Usually they all take showers. 27. When given a complete bed bath, you should A, not wash the patient's genitals because the patient will feel embarrassed. B, use the same washcloth throughout the bath to save you from extra trips. Note, because our CNAs know to prepare for the bath and have extra supplies. C, keep the patient covered as much as possible. I think that's a great option. D, position yourself on one side of the bed and stay there. No, because when you're reaching over the patient, you can contaminate yourself. And so I think the correct answer is going to be C. Let us see. Woohoo! The other choices are wrong because of proper care techniques or body mechanics. And I want to say because of improper care techniques or body mechanics. 28, when assisting Mr. Cohen in two, excuse me, when assisting Mr. Cohen in learning to use a walker, you should A, stand behind him and use a transfer belt. B, put padding all the way around him, around the top rim, put padding all the way around the top rim. I guess you're speaking of the actual walker. No. C, let him walk by himself so he gains independence. No. <laughs> D, let him practice using a walker on the day he is discharged. No. Remember, discharge starts upon admission. And so when physical therapy comes in, does the evaluation and says this person needs a walker, every time we get him out of bed, we're going to allow him to use the walker. I think that the use of the transfer belt um, makes A the best option because the transfer belt allows you to hold on to the resident, but allows him or her to use that walker and you're just supporting them by um, holding on to that belt. So let's see if we're correct. 28 is A. Woohoo! Standing behind him and using a transfer belt prote protects both the client and the nurse aide. 29, before assisting a patient into a wheelchair, check to see if the A, patient is adequately covered, B, floor is slippery, D, door to the room, excuse me, C, door to the room is closed, D, wheels of the chair are locked. Because they're specifically talking about the wheelchair, <laughs> hopefully the floor is not slippery, I'm going to focus on the wheelchair. That was their keyword, wheelchair. And so I'm going to choose the answer D because you don't want to transfer somebody into the wheelchair if the chair is unlocked because they're going, the chair is going to move and your person's going to fall on the floor, whether the floor is slippery or not. So let's see if the answer is D. 
And it is, before assisting a patient into the wheelchair, check to see if the wheels of the chair are locked. 30, when giving an unconscious patient a bath, it is important to A, give passive range of motion to all joints. B, let the team leader exercise the patient's joints. C, call the physical therapist to exercise the patient afterwards. D, exercise the patient only if the doctor has ordered it. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime you're in a patient, you want them moving in a patient's room, you want them moving. And so if you are bathing an unconscious person, when you're lifting their arms to bathe their armpits or what have you, you want to be providing that passive range of motion so that we can keep those joints um, flexible. We don't want them to come stiff. If they become stiff, they get contracted and then it's hard to move that patient. So the answer should be A is an apple. Let us see. Yes, passive range of motion or ROM should always be given with the bath on an unconscious patient. 31, we're almost done everybody. When reporting your patient's condition to your team leader, you should report immediately. A, a rash that appears suddenly. B, warm, dry, and pink skin. C, rough skin on the feet. D, scarred skin. Let's talk about prioritization and emergencies. If the skin is scarred, is that a recent injury? No, that's something that happened a while ago. You would not notify the nurse about that immediately. Um, I hate to tell you, I live in Florida and a lot of people have on sandals and a lot of people have rough skin on their feet. And so that's not something I report immediately. These are actual normal findings depending on the complexion of your patient. Warm, dry, and pink skin. If that's normal for your patient's um, um, skin or race, that's not something you're going to notify the nurse about. This is a sign of anaphylaxis. This is a sign of a rash and your person could immediately start having breathing difficulty. So you want to notify your nurse of this immediately. Maybe the nurse had just given a new medication and the patient did not know they were allergic to it. And yes, the answer is A. Of the um, answers listed, only A is an acute change, acute meaning um, recent. 23, when shaving a male patient's face, you should apply shaving cream sparingly, <laughs> use upward strokes when shaving the cheeks, apply betadine to any nicks. We don't even use betadine anymore. <laughs> D, none of the above. Um, because this is the first question that's given the option, none of the above, I'm going to choose none of the above. I have never shaved a person with a razor. Thank God they have electric shavers now. Upward strokes when shaving the cheeks. Nope, downward. So I'm going to say D as in dog. Oh, Lord, if I miss this one, that means I've missed four. Whoo! <laughs> <laughs> Process of elimination. 33, a decubitus ulcer is A, a stomach ulcer, B, pressure sore, D, duodenal ulcer. That's like when someone has like a GI bleed or D, sore on the toe. And you all should know the answer to this because we've already stated it. A decubitus ulcer is B, a pressure sore. All right. Also referred to as bed sores. 34, you are assigned to assist Mrs. Kelly with her lunch. She is on bed rest. To best position her, the best position for her, if permitted, would be, remember, if we're feeding someone, we can't feed them laying flat. What was the name of the position that had semi and also high? All right. That would have been the Fowler's position. So I'll read through all of these. But Trendelenburg is when we put their head lower than their feet. And we usually only do that when someone is dizzy. OK, and your nurse would usually do that because there are times when even if they are dizzy, let's say they're dizzy and they're short of breath. We're not going to be putting them in Trendelenburg. Hyperextension. OK, that's you're taking them beyond their normal limits. We're not going to do that to a resident dangling at the side of the bed. We can't do that because the question or the sentence here says she's on bed rest. So we're going to keep her in bed, but we're going to elevate the head of the bed. And so this answer says D semi Fowler's. I tell all, all, all of our students to put the patients in a high Fowler's position, but that was an option. So let's see if D is OK. All right. Um, Semi-phallus position is correct because the patient is on bed rest. 
right? 35, when caring for a patient with a nasal gastric tube, that's a tube that goes through the nose, down into the stomach, we can use that for feeding if the person is unable to eat. Let's say they had a recent um, throat surgery, or we can use that to aspirate to suction. Let's say they're vomiting a whole bunch. That way we can pull out those excess fluids. So when caring for a patient with a nasal gastric tube, you should A, offer the patient water if she starts to gag. B, take tape, take the tape off the nose if it bothers the patient. The tape is there to secure the nasal gastric tube. If you move it even a little bit, that means that the tube could be improperly placed. So only nurses should be um, repositioning that tape. C, never unfasten the connecting tubing from the patient's gown. Well, that's not true. Um, B, protect the tube when moving or changing the patient's position. Definitely yes, because if you have a tube in your nose and someone's just moving things around, that tube is also moving. Or moving the tube. Remember, the tube is just not in the nose. It's going down the back of the throat into the person's stomach. So I think the best answer is going to be D. Yes, you must ensure that the tube is not dislodged. 36, to prevent a patient from getting bed sores, you should A, wash urine and feces off with water only. We all know that's not the correct answer. B, put baby powder on the skin to keep it dry. C, rub the reddened area once a day. So we're not massaging bed sores, just FYI, don't do it. <laughs> D, turn the patient every two hours. All right, and I know you know the answer. Yes, it is D as in dog, but let's just reconfirm. And yes, turning the patient is the best way to protect against bed sores. 37, when moving a wheelchair on or off an elevator, you should stay A, behind the chair, pulling it toward you, B, behind the chair, pushing it away from you. C, in front of the patient to observe his or her condition. D, to the side and hold the door open. When moving a wheelchair on or off an elevator, you should... Oh, I don't know if it's A or B. I'm probably about to miss this one too. Behind the patient, behind the chair, pushing it away from you. I'm going to say D. I'm sorry, I'm going to say B as in boy. <laughs> I need to study for my CNA exam, even though I'm a nurse. <laughs> you must stay behind the chair to control it. But it should go but it should go on and come off the elevator backwards to prevent the wheels from falling into the door opening. I know we all do this wrong, but this test, this is what the state says we should do. So remember that on your state examination, okay? I've missed four so far. 38, what position should a patient be in to receive an enema? I know that one. <laughs> supine, Fowler, excuse me, supine, Fowler's, prone is when they're face down on their stomach, left sims. And so when you think about the sims position, if I tell you, hey, um, we need to give the patient an enema, of course you can't give the medicine, but I'm telling you that so that you can prepare the bedding, put those extra pads in the room and under the patient. Whenever you're done turning the patient, placing those pads, I would ask that you leave him or her on his left side. And then I will come in and raise the right arm, raise the right leg, and I can administer the enema. That helps the medicine get further into the colon. So the answer should be D as in dog. And that is correct. The correct answer is left sims. This allows better irrigation of the colon. 39, nursing orders frequently instruct you to assist a patient to cough and deep breathe. This activity helps the patient avoid A, decubitus ulcers, B, pneumonia, C, internal bleeding, D, dyspnea. And so whenever you see the, the prefix DYS, that means pain or difficulty. And so you helping a person cough and breathe is going to help them prevent um, developing pneumonia, removing those fluids that's in the lungs. Hopefully encourage them to deep breathe will help move them and helping them cough actually brings that fluid out. So hopefully I'm right. And the answer is B is in boy. Yay, I'm redeeming myself. <laughs> Coughing and deep breathing forces lower lung movement. 
Great. Question number 40. A patient who has difficulty chewing or swallowing will need what type of diet? A, clear liquid. B, low residue. C, bland. D, mechanical soft. If they have difficulty swallowing, we normally do not give them thin liquids. This did not say anything about adding thickener. And so a clear liquid dye is usually something that we would give to someone who's post-op in case they vomit. We, you know, we don't want them to have food particles. We start off with clear liquids. Low residue means like low fiber. Bland, like bananas, rice, apples, and toast. Um, but it doesn't say, you know, if you're giving someone toast and they're having a hard time chewing or swallowing, they could swallow a large bite of food and that could be detrimental. So the best answer is going to be D. When you notify me, the nurse, and you're feeding a patient and they start coughing or they're having difficulty swallowing, you notify me, I will come and assess, and then I will go ahead and notify the doctor. On the doctor, will more than likely order a speech therapist consultation where they'll do like a swallowing evaluation. And based off of that evaluation, they will let us know if the person needs a mechanical soft diet, thickened liquids, et cetera. And so I think the best answer for number 40 is D is in dog. And yes, it is. A mechanical soft diet is always um, easy to chew, swallow, and digest. 41, how often should you total a patient's intake and output records? A, wants a shift. B, twice a day, C, every four hours, D, every 12 hours. And so normally you want to do your totals at least once per shift. And um, your shift could be a four, eight or 12 hour shift. I'm not sure you're working. And so hopefully this is correct. And yes, intake and output are total once per shift as well as every 24 hours. 42, the Foley bag, that's a urinary drainage bag that collects the urine. The Foley bag must be kept lower than the patient's bladder so that A, urine will not leak out soiling the bed. Your system should be a closed system. So urine should never see leak out, whether it's in the right position or in the incorrect position. If that happens, please notify your nurse. Question B, excuse me, option B, urine will not return to the bladder causing an infection. Possibly. Option C, the bag will be hidden and the patient will not be embarrassed. Or D, the patient will be more comfortable in the bed. So whenever you have somebody who has a urinary drainage catheter, you never want to bring that bag up above the bladder because in doing so, old urine can travel back into the urinary system and cause an infection. So the answer should be B as in boy. And yes, we are correct. Raising the bag above the bladder level can lead to a backflow of the urine with its bacteria into the bladder. 43, when assisting a nurse to irrigate a patient's bladder, you notice that the nurse has contaminated the sterile field. You should. You should tell her. <laughs> A, tell the doctor right away. B, tell the charge nurse right away. C, offer to get the nurse another sterile pack. That's a good CNA. D, ignore it because the nurse is doing the procedure. No, we are a team. And if a nurse is irrigating someone's bladder and she contaminates a sterile field, that means she's now putting germs into the patient's bladder and that patient is not going to get better. They're going to have an infection. And so I would nicely ask, would you like another sterile pack? You're there to assist. And so hopefully she will be um, um, appreciative of your efforts. And the answer is C. The nurse may not realize she or he has done this. Nurses are humans too, and they make mistakes. 44, as I've already missed four questions, I thank you for loving me regardless. 44, when distributing drinking water, the nursing assistant should A, use only disposable cups and pitchers. B, give ice to all patients. C, follow the policy of the institution. D, make sure that all pitchers are filled completely. Oh man, this one's a hard one. I've not seen disposable pitchers, so I don't think it's A. Um, I don't like cold beverages, so to give me ice would be a waste of your time. 
Um, some patient could be on a fluid restriction. So when it says fill all the pictures completely, um, D is concerning to me. So I'm going to say C, follow the policy of your institution, especially following COVID, because if you have this one universal picture that you take in and out of everybody's rooms, you could actually be contaminating that picture and by default contaminating your patients. So hopefully the answer to 44 is C. Yes, agencies may have different policies. 45, Mr. Kaplan's orders include the notation strain all urine. This means that you should report A, the output in milliliters, B, the color of the urine, C, any complaints the patient makes, D, any particles in the strainer. So I want you to think about the reason why we'd be straining urine what would actually be in the urine? Maybe somebody actually had some stones, kidney stones. And so if you see any particles in a strainer, that is a, maybe they actually pass a stone and they'll have less pain. So the answer to 45 should be D as in dog. Ooh, we are doing so good. The purpose of the order to strain the urine is to detect particles, AKA stones <laughs> or calcifications. 46. Swelling caused by excess fluid in body tissues is called A, fluid intake, B, diarrhea, C, perspiration, D, edema. You all know this one. The answer should be D as in dog, edema. The term given to fluid held in the body tissues that may cause them to swell is edema. I did not make this test, so don't, don't write me about that misspelling. I love y'all. <laughs> 47, Mr. Black is a diabetic. For Oh, excuse me, Mrs. Black is a diabetic. For her mid-afternoon nourishment, the kitchen has sent a carton of chocolate ice cream. Where is she at? Your first action should be to substitute diet cola for the ice cream, or B, hold the nourishment and report to the team leader. C, ask the ward clerk, this is an old test, to notify the kitchen of an error. D, ask Mrs. Black if she likes the ice cream. Look, my baby CNAs, get that ice cream away from her. Because if you leave it in her room, even if she is a diabetic, she's going to eat it. And you don't want to replace it. It's like bribing her. You know what? Give me the ice cream and I'll give you a Diet Coke. All right. So you're going to hold it and you're going to report it to the team leader um, for your CNA examination in the state of Florida. That term team leader would be charge nurse. And that way the nurse would be able to notify the dietary um, office or department that your patient received the wrong tray. Um, they should have received a diet, excuse me, a diabetic tray and not a regular diet. Yeah, and the answer is B. Always report up normal conditions. 48, your assignment sheet has the following notation, S and A, A, C, T, I, D for Mr. Able. This means that you should... <laughs> a, take the axillary temperature and systolic blood pressure after care is given two times a day. B, do a routine sugar and acetone urine test before meals three times a day. Do a routine sugar and acid test, excuse me, stool test after Mr. Mr. Abel's next three stools. Offer snacks and ginger ale three times a day. You all, S and A is not an approved abbreviation in the state of Florida. AC is before meals and TID is three times a day. So let's see if one of these specifically states before meals and three times a day. All right, so I'm going to say it is this one because AC stands for before meals and TID stands for three times a day. So I'm going to say it is B, but your facility will have a list of approved abbreviations. And so that's why we ask that you don't write things that we don't understand because I have never, and I've been a nurse for 24 years, never seen the abbreviation SNA. So let's see, I think it's B. Woohoo! process of elimination. SNA is a diabetic test done on urine before meals. 48, Mr. Brooke has a broken hip and needs to have an enema. The best type of bed pan to use would be A, A, fracture pan, B, plastic pan, C, child size pan, D, metal pan. And a fracture pan is that little, little slender kind of angled bed pan that, that has a handle that you can easily slide under a patient who doesn't have the mobility, who can't lift a whole bunch. So the answer to 49 is A is an apple. 
All right, so choose a fracture pan. So Mr. Brooke will have a minimal distance to lift his hips. 50, before you ambulate a patient who has a Foley catheter, remember that urinary drainage bag, you should A, clamp off the catheter and disconnect it since the bag would be in the way. Absolutely not. B, leave the catheter dangling between the patient's legs. Come on, absolutely not. C, carry the bag before below the level of the bladder. C, hide the bag in a pillowcase so the patient will not be embarrassed. This is about recovery, not about embarrassment. And when you're in the hospital, they won't have a leg bag or a leg strap per se. You would just have to hold the bag, but hold it in the proper position. So the answer is going to be C as in cat. You cannot disconnect the bag without an order but you still must ensure that the bag remains below the bladder level. All right, you all guess what? That is the conclusion of our test. I thought there were 60 questions, but there are only 50. And so if there are two points each and I miss four, my overall score would have been a 92%. And I know some of you all did better on this test than I did. Regardless, I hope you had fun. Thank you for spending this hour with me. And if I can be of any further assistance, my name is Eunice Mathis. I'm the owner of Florida Train Academy. I wish you the best of luck on your CNA exam prep test and your future endeavors, whether that's going to be nursing or pre-med school. We appreciate you and we thank you for watching. Bye, everybody.